Greetings and good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. My name is Zim Vajran and I am here with you all tonight on Gaming Materialists, our co-produced show that we do with TIR and of course our good friend, the baddest, baddest of the left, Mr. Hey, Vaughn. Hey, Vaughn, how are you doing? I'm okay. Uh, you know, as far as as far as things these days go, we're talking about something that doesn't induce a heart attack. So, uh, yeah, something good. that's uh, something that's not uh, super gloomy. Well, it is super gloomy, but it's not really super gloomy. It's super gloomy, but of yeah. no import. So, of no, of, yeah, exactly, of no import. Like most of the things we discover, uh, we discuss on this show, they don't really matter. They're just our fantasy hobbies. But everybody needs hobbies. Now, so at least this one's a fantasy hobby that we all admit is a fantasy hobby. But anyway, that's true. It's not. It's not like uh, yeah. It's not like uh, organizing, as people talk about it today, which seems to be mainly <coughs> retweeting uh, pro or against Vash um, tweets. Well, just so uh, the audience is caught up on what we're planning on talking about today, is we are very excited to continue on with our discussion of White Wolf Publishing, Vampire the Masquerade, although ma- uh, and the broader setting within which Vampire the Masquerade takes place, the so-called World of Darkness. Uh, so to recap from what we discussed last time, we talked about the emergence of White Wolf Publishing, the beginnings of Vampire the Masquerade as a role-play game, how Vampire the Masquerade really caught the zeitgeist of the 1990s, how it, to a certain extent, transformed role-playing, bringing in women into the uh, uh, into the hobby in unprecedented numbers, uh, leading to the formation of a very active LARPing scene where people dressed up and LARPed and did all kinds of things, and how more generally it shifted away, uh, it shifted role-play games uh, away from the more war games orientated early phase of war games, where it was about combat, where it was about statistics and rules, to a kind of role-playing that was much more story uh, orientated and story driven. And of course, White Wolf created its own setting the world of darkness vampire the masquerade where everybody played vampires was the first game but it led to a host of different games set in that same universe werewolf (coughs) the apocalypse uh i don't know they had all kinds like changeling the dreaming uh wraith the oblivion uh uh what's the other one Uh, mage the ascension mummy the accursed i think Uh, yeah there is Mummy the Accursed. I actually have. I discovered going through my uh, boxes at my parents' house that I have a copy of Mummy the Accursed or whatever it's called. Although I have Chronicles to... of Darkness even has more. We'll get to that. So I will say this: uh, like I do, kind of feel like they were running out of supernatural creatures to like make role play games about. Because like Mummy, it's like <coughs> <coughs> come on, man, like. Who wants to play freaking mummies? Like, we're all mummies, and we're all going to, like, what are we going to do? Like, vampires, I get. Werewolves, I get. Well, once you get started to, like, Changeling, the Dreaming, you know, it's like, come on. You know, what are you going to have? Cuck the Cucketing. Uh, you know, podcast the failing. You know, I don't know. Like, you could have all kinds of things. They had, to, like, a very nice formula. So, <clears throat> White Wolf. Uh, goes through the roof in popularity in the 90s. They even have a TV series, which if you which you can watch on YouTube, uh, a Vampire the Masquerade and TV. It's bad. It's really bad, but it's 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 one of those things where it gets so bad it's good. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, you know, but at a certain point, they are publishing so many books. It's difficult to keep up with their meta plot, the storyline. And eventually, in the early 2000s, I think 2003, 2004, they bring 
the original World of Darkness setting to an end. They publish a book, uh, the Gehenna book. Gehenna is the big end of the world event that has been hinted at for the entire decade and a bit of the game's existence. And they finally end the universe and have a total reboot. And they go into a new world. What uh, It's called... Um, it's not called World of Darkness anymore, is it? Or it is called World of Darkness. Is that right, uh, Vaughn? It was originally called World of Darkness. It was rebranded <coughs> in 2000. And um, uh, I believe it was rebranded in 2013 or 2014 as Chronicle. No, 2011 Darkness. Um, because that's the 20th anniversary vampire. I'll get to that later. Um, so... There are two major problems with with World of Darkness. One affects only the LARPers, and one affected the tabletop. Um, the LARPers, the LARPing became prohibitive to enter because not only did you have to know whatever the local uh, history was for the LARP game that you were playing towards the early middle of the aughts, but also the entire meta plot, particularly if you were in the official Camarilla or uh, One World organization, there was at least three major One World organizations, one of which still exists, um, because all those meta plots were canon to the game, and White Wolf had released a book a month for ten years, and as we talked about last show. All their stuff was was rules and backwards compatible up to this point. So anything published in any other book, even if it contradicted another book, was potentially canon. And the books did contradict each other because they weren't developed with universal oversight. Um, but then in the in the actual tabletop RPG portion of it, there was another problem. The rules were never compatible between the games, even if the world was. That's kind of a nightmare. Meaning that if you were, even though you're supposed to be playing in the same world, if you were to take a Changeling Lost or a Mage or whatever into your vampire game, or vice versa, you actually had to readjust the stats and rules as an NPC and not follow the rules as published in a book. Um, and just to clarify, just to clarify on that is that the basic systems between all these games were the same to a certain degree. So on the surface, it looked like they were compatible, but in terms of the rule sets, uh, they like greatly varied so that they kind of made it impossible to play with. So, for example, werewolves were a lot stronger than vampires. And some of the magic that mages could use basically broke the game if you were playing with other creatures. So right. it wasn't that they were entirely not compatible. It was that they were semi-compatible, but they weren't really very well balanced to play together. They weren't designed right, right. to play. They had the same kind of infrastructure and pl uh, plumbing but the facades were quite different, which made it difficult to mesh those games together. And people wanted to play those games together as they were releasing them. Right. So, you, and what they, well, and furthermore, they were designed not to be played together, but they were antagonists for each other. It made very little sense. Uh, and, and by, I mean, to get crunchy for a second, the, the 10 sided dice mechanic was the same for all of them, as was the ability stats, but they weren't balanced at all. And also, the powers did not work together, they weren't written yeah. to be written to work. Together. <coughs> so, White Wolf gets all of its designers to do this, and they also start with the idea of hey, won't it be interesting if you start off as a human, just normal baseline human, and you can even play the entire game now as just a person. All right. Um, what what would it do if we if we redesign this world with that in mind? The first thing they release is uh, is Vampire. Now, Vampire the Requiem, which comes out in two thousand and four, and then they they release Werewolf the the Reckoning. Um, it is Werewolf the Reckoning. Yeah. Um, and. Immediately, the vampire game has a problem. 
Werewolf the Forsaken. The Forsaken, yes. Excuse me, it's, it's Hunter, Hunter the Reckoning, the which was Hunter an old, the... yeah. The other thing is their names get really, really redundant, and it gets worse as time goes on. Because I know if they really, they really are obsessed with this like supernatural key, creature, the something, right? So they rebalance everything. They come up with a system where everything has two variables of five and five, and then customizations below that. All the stats start with a baseline human assumption. All disciplines are designed in each game to be interworkable. But in Vampire, they actually keep parts of the old nomenclature and world and not other parts. Now, in the other games, they actually don't do this. Like Mage, all the traditions are erased and they start with new things. And in, in, in Werewolf, they do the same thing because there's cultural appropriation issues and they're becoming aware of that. Uh, White Wolf had always prided itself, as we talked about it, being problematic now. But actually, for the 90s, it deliberately tried to be inclusive. And so early why, on, can mm -hmm. you tell say why for why the original, for example, werewolf was uh, problematic was becoming problematic? Well, I mean, you had stuff like the Fianna, the Geta Fenris, and the various Native American tribes turned into werewolves, and uh, they were based on like archetypical views of what it means to be, I don't know, a Viking. Uh, what it means to be an Irish person, what it means to be an indigenous person in particular, <coughs> and uh, an Egyptian in the case of the Anubis, etc. So they had all these ethnic stereotypes that they used. They had originally tried to do this to be less Eurocentric right. in their presentation. Um, uh, that's that's in Werewolf. Now you had it in uh, Vampire, but not as much. You know, There's only like three clans where it was really, really bad in Vampire. You had the but, Romani clan, right? Yeah, the, the Ravenous, Ravenous who, who were clearly who they, Romani. Who they began to change it because originally they were the Romani clan, and then they were like, oh, actually they're the ruling clan in India, and the the only reason they the it's just that the only ones that come to the West are Romanis. So right. they changed. Slightly uh, over time, so even the Asimites, who are the terrorist Muslim clan, um, originally they were the terrorist Muslim clan. Eventually, they changed them a bit so that they were also sorcerers and intellectuals. They had like different bloodlines: the assassins, the viziers, and the the right. the, the magic. Although they guys. still they, had the terrorists. They had, they had, and they still had the terrorists, and also there were the followers of Set, who were uh, like. Egyptian, ancient Egyptians. There's also the far the followers of Osiris, but they hardly ever came up. So, right. um, so they get rid of all that. They get rid of all that in Vampire Two. Actually, um, they remove all the ethno clans. Like for example, there is a uh, a an antagonist clan that is basically the Asimites Seven, but they have no ethnic background in. But they rebalance the game. Um, they redo the world, but they keep enough stuff from the original game in the case of Vampire that it's actually disorienting. Um, like some of the disciplines are the same, but they don't actually work the same way. A few of the clans are the same, but they're not like, so they have the same name, but they have different, uh, correlations. Uh, so for example, like the Malkavian... Uh, which is the which was another problematic clan, but for different reasons because it was based off of mental, of, health. Uh, mental health. They get rid of them and split them between two different clans. They give their downside to the to the Ventru uh, now the power based clan. So now the Ventru have have a tendency of going insane, which is seen as less problematic because it's specific to to power. And so there's right. specific kinds of uh, derangement. And then they they give their abilities to the Mikad and take away the whole insanity part of it. Um, so, But there's enough overlapping that people didn't know how different of a game they were getting. Right. Um, because the backlash for people who stayed on with White Wolf for the other games was not there. So, like, Changeling uh, The Lost, which is the Changeling of Dreaming Rewrite, is more popular in some ways and probably a better game, actually, than Changeling of Dreaming. Same was somewhat true with even with their Mage game. And Mage was super popular for being super innovative, but they completely changed that world. It 
and it w- and they went well, but the only book that was really bought in mass was the vampire book. It was bought. It was one of the best sellers, and then none of the supplements were bought. Um, the other games weren't bought very well, people, and they because mm-hmm. uh, people were invested. Not simply in the notion of playing a vampire, but they were invested in a meta plot that had been developing and a world that they felt comfortable in uh, for for a decade. And even though mechanically this was a very logical rationalization of the rules, the changes in story, and I think you're probably right, the fact that they kept some of the old uh, terminology... (coughs) some of the old clan names but put them in a new a new setting was confusing and uh you know nerds are not known to be big fans of innovation and things that they like and i think it would i think i think people unfairly judged that game uh because they they just were like i want to play my old vampire i don't want to play uh a new setting I think you're totally right on that. And then you got to add to the additional problem is this game is written to be a tabletop game. Right. It is not actually written. They do come up with LARP rules for it, but it's not written to be LARPable in the same way. Also, right. they at the same time, the Camarilla is disbanded, kind of. It loses its official status because they don't need it anymore. There is a IP conflict because the Camarilla tries to actually claim IP not to fight with White Wolf, but to fight with the other organizations that exist as, um, as uh, as One World of Darkness playing the old right. the old World of Darkness. Uh, there's a lawsuit and the Camarilla gets disbanded, but it looks like White Wolf is attacking its fans. So those two things happen at the same time. Um, and, and, and in some ways, it is unfortunate because I, I I will actually go out on a on a limb and say that the the redesigned game, the Chronicles of Darkness game, is actually a better game in most ways, particularly yeah, I mean, as a tabletop they, RPG. They took a lot of lessons that they'd learned in making games for a, a decade, but you know when you have game systems, the especially when you iterate on them, um, there's a kind of dead weight of old game design. That it becomes difficult to get rid of, right? It right. Becomes... And I think, yeah, I think what we see with them is actually completely parallel to what happened with 3.5 uh DD moved into fourth. Now, I don't like fourth ed DD, I'll go ahead and admit that. Um, but it was too big of a shift, even though fourth ed DD actually even combat in it's kind of a nightmare, but it was more balanced. Um, and it was, they fixed a lot of problems and created a lot of new ones, but, 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 but you had the same response. So what did people do in the case of 3.5 to four fed? They went to Pathfinder, which just continued the same thing, but there was no equivalent of that in, in White Wolf. Um, so White Wolf struggles trying to get people to buy into this for years. They see that, um, some of the downstream games from from vampire actually do okay like their mage game sells okay the i think actually the changeling game that came out under uh um this chronicles of dark or what will become chronicles of darkness what back then was called new world darkness actually did a little better than the original changeling game but right. in general they didn't have a flagship anymore right the, the larps that survived continued playing the old game they didn't stop. They kept the same rules. There were a few new <coughs> vampire LARPs. But another thing that we have to like look at that I don't think gets talked about enough, because we, now we're just talking about this internal to, to White Wolf. At the same time, what happens in World Playland? Well, during the early aughts, White Wolf is starting to slow down. And tabletop RP White Wolf is continuing to maintain largely off LARP, but tabletop RPGs get revitalized in 2000 by a different company, and that is Wizards launching their version of an open license DD. And the open license part of it also means 
that supplementary producers also produce for D&D. So another thing that's been happening in the background that we haven't talked about this because it's 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 so it's it's periphery. White Wolf kind of predicted this was going to be a problem, and started trying to launch non-World of Darkness games. I think the biggest one is Exalted. Um, they also got into developing kind of actually shit stuff, but they 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 ended up doing developing with uh with themselves and then a couple of uh people who broke away from wizards of the coast uh monty cook actually worked for white wolf for a little while um developing kind of cheap D D products but these don't do very well either and they're flooded in the market so white wolf's backstop for the world of darkness also for this new world of darkness loss also doesn't succeed it is in a glutted market of uh ogl of open license uh, D and D stuff because D- White Wolf knows that it now has a competitor in Wizards version versus TSSR, which they had crushed. And I would also add to this: this was also the beginning of the rise of the MMO. Right. <clears throat> so a lot of people, you know, now we're seeing a shift away. You know, I, I don't think MMOs are like in terminal decline or anything like that, but. You know, there was a huge cultural phenomenon of World of Warcraft, people getting into online uh, EverQuest, World of Warcraft, except yeah. The the predecessor Star Wars one that they had as well. There was a whole bunch of MMOs that I think attracted people. I think today there is like a little bit of a uh, th- those things come off as a bit faddish in the sense that people are like, yeah, actually I I like tabletop role play, you know. But I think also White Wolf suffered from the fact that a lot of people were getting into MMOs at that time, too. And the last mistake it did is it didn't just push this new product out. It also pulled its old product. So not only did they not... I mean, and, and what, what was maddening about this, they were publishing Dark, uh, Dark Ages blanks for example, Dark Ages, uh, new Dark Ages books for the old World of Darkness, up to the moment they launched the new World of Darkness. So they not just had Gehenna in that world, they also had been releasing stuff for their Dark Ages line in the same world, and they kill it after just launching books, including literally a brand new, a couple of brand new games, Dark Ages Fey and Dark Ages like Mage. So, which came out like months before they ended the line. So people also were resentful about that. You released right. a game that you didn't intend to service like week, like a few months before you ended the entire line. And when they ended the line, they didn't just stop making new versions of that books. They pulled them from the market. All right. So the only way you could get White Wolf books at that point that weren't New World of Darkness books was on the second half market, which of course created uh, a price glut, but it also like it really drove resentment. Um, because I was I remember being pissed off personally. Um, I had quit LARPing by this time, but I was still kind of interested in the books and I was co- and I was collecting them. And they literally shifted, and I'm like, shit, I have to buy something completely new. And it wasn't like a fade out; it was yeah. just a hard cut. It was. Um, it was- it was a poorly, you know, it was a poorly handled transition. Right. And so they struggle with this for 11, for basically until 2011. But they get the idea. They see the MMOs and like, okay, okay, we can save our business if we get invested into MMOs. So around 2006, I think, um, let me actually make sure I'm accurate on that real fast. Uh, they, they get into... Um, they get into uh, they, they basically get into making a massive online role playing game for the original uh, Vampire the Masquerade because they had a game that had come out right before they ended the line to a Vampire Bloodlines that was incredibly popular yeah. as a role playing game. So they figure they can translate this into an MMO. So they <coughs> so they they deliberately pair up and get more or less bought out by um the owners of eve online yeah so just just so uh just to give people a bit of context um 
there was a Troika Games, which is a legendary games company, made this game Bloodlines. Uh, and uh, Bloodlines was uh, a flawed masterpiece, people call it. It had good voice acting. It had, you know, it had everything you need to, uh, uh, you know, to make a good game. But it was very buggy. But people really appreciated that game. And then we see the, you know, basically... Uh, the the owners of Eve Online come into the come into the scene and they promise this huge open world uh, RPG, which I think the with the popularity of MMOs, <coughs> I think was very attractive to very many Vampire the Masquerade uh, players, especially because it was set in the in the old setting and not the new setting. And I have a little trailer here for everyone to take a look at, so let, let's play that trailer, Vaughn. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that trailer, that trailer, um, people went nuts for it, right? Yeah, they did. What What's fascinating about that, though, is that now the, 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 we mentioned a documentary on this. People can go watch it because it covers this probably as much as I'm going to try to go through this real fast. But a couple of things happen at this point. So the new World of Darkness line is doing okay, but it is never gaining the mark anything close to the market share they used to have in the 90s. Um, and they're investing their entire survival strategy off of this game. Um, so CP, uh, CCP Games, who are the people who run EVE Online, like buy what uh, kind of merge with White Wolf um, and if you in don't 2006. Know what, and if you don't know what EVE Online is, it is a huge space economy piracy simulator in, in, in which people are super invested in. Like they sell their spaceships on EVE Online for thousands of dollars. So it's a right. it's a big game. It's a big giant it's still a big game. Still but, a big game. But it's not owned by CCP anymore, which is interesting in and of itself. So we'll so what happens is they try this. It's not going it, it, this this is in development hell until 2015, but it really seems like it's stalling out. White Wolf in a desperate in a desperate plea does two things. It really pushes the game in 2011 and then it releases old World of Darkness back as World of Darkness, 
rebrands New World of Darkness as Chronicles of Darkness. So now, to correct the mistake they made in the past, they relaunch their old line and maintain the new line. So they're like, so look, if you like, if you came in in the aughts and you like our that product line, we're going to continue it. Um, if you want to play uh, Vampire Masquerade, we're going to release a 20th anniversary edition. We're going to streamline the rules, but we're going to keep the world and we're going to pretend like Gehenna mostly never happened. And we're going to kind of steady state the meta plot. They do this in 2011, and it actually does so decently. But two things start to happen. One, most of the world has moved on. All right, people are in the Pathfinder by this point. We like tabletop gaming is actually increasing in popularity, um, but it's not the tabletop gaming which White Wolf came to dominate in the 90s. It is back to something like the war games tradition. Uh, that had come up before too. Um, CCP starts to lose money, not just from all the money it's spending on this White Wolf product line, and not just because it's not really making money in book publishing because very few people are. All right. Um, even in like uh, Wizards of the Coast, the book, the actual physical book publishing of it is to get people invested in other things. Let's be honest. Um, the, the, uh, what happens is EVE Online kind of reaches peak growth. All right. And starts to fall back. Now it's still, it's still to this day actually is pretty well played uh, MMORPG, but MMORPGs in general start to lose steam. And I can tell you why. Uh, cell phone games become popular. Oh, I mean, like, seriously. I mean, it's that's that's <coughs> kind of that simple. Um, <coughs> excuse me, MMORPGs are not adaptable to smartphones, right? Yeah, they are adaptable to consoles, but they're not adaptable to smartphones. And the other thing is, there's all these scandals around this time period about people even outside of the States becoming addicted to MMORPGs, like losing their livelihoods to playing them all the time that, you know, so this all happens. Eve's not at the top end of that. It's, it's a very beloved game, but it is not world of Warcraft or, you know, or even something like EverQuest two um, or elder scrolls online or any of that. So it starts to lose money. So CCP, the first thing it does is it spins off White Wolf. It releases the the RPG line. It says, you can have the rights to that. You can form a creative-owned collective called Onyx Path. We'll come back to that. All right. White Wolf will remain devoted to this MMORPG. It will be CCP America. That's what we're going to devote it to. But we're going to have to cut back investment in this game. Uh, but they've already been developing it for like six years at this point. Yeah, so it's, um, so so there's uh you know people are getting fatigued, and it's becoming it becomes like uh, Star Citizen, the MMO that will never ever see the light of day. Right, and so this doesn't see the light of day. So so Onyx Path, Onyx Path starts gets the rights to both, kind of. This is important to both. Uh, the old world of darkness line and the chronicles of darkness, which they rebrand and they continue publishing. But what they they not get the rights to? Well, the the Vampire the Masquerade twentieth edition, which was supposed to relaunch the the world of darkness line, was released by White Wolf. White was owned by CCP, so CCP retains the copyright to just Vampire the Masquerade, part of the world of darkness. Everything else is spun off. CCP finally sells it after it cans the game in 2015 to Paradox Entertainment. Now, I guess Paradox is also initially planning to release an MMORPG, but that never happens. Okay, so, so there's this one book, that, uh, and a little bit of a line. The book 
the uh, the Vampire the Masquerade twentieth edition supplement line also goes with um, uh, Onyx Path. Onyx Path, however, is creator owned and it doesn't have a lot of capital or overhead, so it survives off of two things: Kickstarter, which is coming into being around this time, and Drive Through RPG. Right. Now, if you. So it doesn't publish its own books. It just does its own development. And its development is funded by Kickstarter. So they move from producing. And the other thing you got to know about like White Wolf books is they, they produced a nice mid-tier book in the 90s. And the aughts, when they actually used to use terms to compete, they actually produce really, really nice, but really expensive books. But they move these same books over to Drive Through RPG, which, if you've ever bought a Drive Through RPG book, is okay. Um, but it's they're, not they're the serviceable. Best. It's not the best. Uh, it's a print on demand service, right? And it's not even the be- like. It's hardcover editions are not even like they're not stitch bound print on demand or anything like that. It's no, it's, it's very standard. Glue. They're just glue bound. Uh, uh, and and actually, I, I love that now they're ironically more expensive than prestige books. Um, a, a nice color print from Drive Through RPG can run you for a hundred dollars, right? Um, and you can buy, you know, from Amazon a mass, you know, a mass produced prestige book for fifty or sixty. Exactly, yeah, but uh, I mean, <clears throat> Drive Through RPG. Uh, really became an important vehicle for a lot of these smaller companies to survive. Right. And Onyx Path basically moves the White Wolf line from a from a mass company back to what it began as. Like, it's a small creator-produced company with no corporate backing and very little assets. Doesn't have a lot of overhead. Uh, some people stay on with the line. They stay on with, with Paradox. Um, so, Paradox... Uh, bought all of its intellectual properties but the only intellectual property that 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 white wolf still really had as white wolf as a division of cpp was vampire the masquerade so now you have a problem you have this revised edition that actually did finally give everybody what they wanted it cleaned up the rules it gave people all the old stuff combined in the one book but it never got service correctly and I, I, I never even had this book because I was out of the country at this point. But, but like it never got serviced correctly, and it ne- and it also after its initial print run, its initial print run is actually super nice editions. But after that, it's only produced through Drive Through RPG. You can still buy it today through Drive Through RPG. You know that's where you can get it now. Um, White Wolf also makes like like a uh, like TSSR through Wizards makes all of its old stuff available through. Right, uh, drive through RPG. The the real versions go sell for a lot now. Um, Onyx Path gets all the other licenses, so now White Wolf is just Vampire the Masquerade. That's it. So Renegade goes to relaunch it. Um, and one, it focuses its distribution actually <coughs> mostly <coughs> on Europe. All right. Um, two, uh, they, they kind of give up. They, they they create a massive mishap when they release Vampire 5th Edition in 2018. Because in that book, they they actually get a lot of the developers and writers from Europe. And one of the some of the writers were actually from Chechnya. And they they included some material about the killing of uh of queer chechens in the meta plot which was a fundamental mistake it causes a, a huge backlash actually more in europe than in the united states um there's also the scandal about you know the outright like there's a description of one of the vampire clans that they might be an outright person there's a there's a lot of uh <coughs> Some of the edginess of Vampire the Masquerade um, gets it into trouble. And I say edginess right. in virtual comments. Some of the things that may have flown in the 90s are not flying in 2018. Right, because there's a there's a neo-Nazi aesthetic in a Bruja subclan. Like, yeah. Um, 
So that creates a huge backlash. They pull uh, fifth edition immediately. They dissolve the White Wolf independent creative team that had come over from from CCP. What little of it was left and hadn't gone on its path, which wasn't a lot. It's basically Justin Anasili, who's the major vampire director from like third edition, uh, a revised edition forward. Um, and and uh, then um, and so. Uh, White Wolf is White Wolf. It's one property. It's subsumed into Redig into Paradox Entertainment. Paradox Entertainment licenses Redigate Games to come in and run what White Wolf was running with some of the of the original team left, and then decides to not even risk distribution rights itself and runs distribution through the Swedish company. Uh, or I don't know if they're Swedish, but they produce they they seem to disproportionately spread Swedish uh, games in English, which is Mordifius. Uh, Mordifius becomes their distributor, um, and this fifth edition Masquerade book has never taken off. It's actually done less well than even the 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 Chronicles of Darkness books, um, because the other thing is. Um, it's distri it's it's distribution chain actually is not primarily in the United States. It's primarily in Europe. Um, while it has a lot of the same people who were part of the original team, not a lot, a few. Um, like I said, Justin Asili being the main one. Um, Mark Renhagen occasionally would consult coming back from you know obscurity. Uh, but in general, uh, there was literally. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of push in the United States for it period. It was mainly marketed seemingly towards a European audience and it's first out, out of the gate thing as a scandal. Um, meanwhile, they also don't have any other parts of the line. All the other parts of the line are still being run by, uh, by a mixture of the storytellers guild and on express publishing <laughs> through drive to the RPG out of Pennsylvania. All right. So and and at one point it's unclear actually in, in 2020 during the Modifius piece if there was not going to be two different vampire masquerade editions if more right. if if Onyx pa uh, Path was still going to be publishing uh uh, tw uh 20th uh uh 20th anniversary of history and uh supplements and maybe even a, a 25 year uh no I guess we're approaching year 30, actually a 30 year uh, reboot, or if it was just going to be fifth edition, it looks like the rights have been reverted to just fifth edition. Um, Modifius is now releasing it to America, but it's, if you look at like uh, it's not, it's not produced by Modifius or the other major companies It it actually releases like a uh, free Liga and some of the other companies that it releases in America. And it's not really pushed by them very highly either. So it's right. it's not even like it's hard to actually get on Amazon anything more than the base book. You can get the base book, but like the supplements are even hard to get. Yeah, you have to really look around for them. Right. Like you can't even order them easily um, in the United States and you can't get them through drive through RPG because they're not part of Onyx Path Press. So it looks like White Wolf's um, Vampire Masquerade may finally be coming to an end. I don't know. They're still releasing new supplements for it. Um, <coughs> but um, the right stuff in this has been a nightmare, though, because as each after the MMORPG, different companies that were not our, uh, tabletop companies would get it, sublet it, kind of run it as a sub company with a completely different mission, and then let it die. Um, or sell it off, yeah. or subsume it, or this and the other. Yeah, so it's had a very troubled recent history. I think certainly the fifth edition get has given it. A, a, there's a new interest in it. They moved the meta plot on, so they kind of undid the Gehenna. Right, Gehenna was, sort of kind of happened, but didn't. <laughs> but didn't. <laughs> yeah. So we're just gonna have to see what direction vampire the masquerade is going going to but uh, going in but certainly i don't see it gaining the cultural relevance um it did ha it had in the 90s no and larping 
LARPing is pretty much dead. I mean, I think COVID probably finally put the last nail in that coffin, but... The tragedy of the Lapas. Who, who would think of the Lapas? Um, yeah, they all they all went into politics is what happened, and now look what... No, I'm kidding. They all have podcasts like us now. They all became... Uh, they all, they became... all became left celebrities and got to MMORPG their politics instead of their fantasies. Exactly. It's all, it's all a big lap. Uh, Barn is actually a vampire. He's he's he has a character sheet. Maybe we should make a podcasting role play game where like everybody plays po podcasts, uh, podcasters, and you have different podcaster statistics, anger, parasocial <laughs> relations. You know, uh, anger, parasocial relations, <coughs> um, sexual frustration, in, 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 inappropriate Twitter outburst, uh, inappropriate Twitter outburst. Yeah, exactly. You have to deal. Uh, you have you have to deal with inappropriate the aftermath of inappropriate uh, Twitter outbursts. The... So I guess I guess the question is: We went through all this history, and this is like the less sexy part in the beginning. But what we can learn? There's a lot of things we can learn from this. One is cultural norms are, are hard for people to gauge over long periods of time. And one thing I will say about vampire is from revised edition in 1998 onward the team the lead team is fairly static for 20 years like justin asili has been running vampire and been the head writer and vampire and he's good at it but he's been that person since 1998 he is still that person under um under the paradox entertainment fifth ad um he was the major developer for Vampire Requiem, too. I mean, it's just been consistent throughout. Um, I think that leads to a certain amount of uh, some, somewhat, what so to say, blindness to younger people. But the other thing is, one of the things we haven't talked about this, and Vampire is part of how this happened, is the average age of role players actually went up right. from... From the early teens <coughs> to young adulthood, and in the case of like D and D, it actually like the like D and D age ranges from like fifteen to like fifty five. Like it's, but if you think about if you had or people who've been LARPing vampire since the beginning still in it, those people are now in their mid fifties, right? At youngest, so it's it's been a long time. Um, uh, and the break, the break in Vampire the Masquerade, has meant that there is a there's a gap in the flow of people coming into the game. Right. Like Dungeons and Dragons, for all the troubles it had, there's there's always been a version of Dungeons and Dragons in print. Right. Vampire the Masquerade has not that has not been the case, and people lost interest, and that continuity was broken. I think there's also a design thing you can learn is that setting anything contemporaneously to one time, if you even last more than a decade, means you're not going to be contemporaneous even 10 years later. I mean, because one of the things I say about Vampire 20th Anniversary, which is fun, but it's late 90s nostalgia. Like, right. like it, it is a nostalgia game. And it's hard to... I mean, like, how are you going to sell late night? Like, maybe, you know, I will say this. The one thing I will say about 5th edition, I, I, I cracked it open yesterday. I finally got a copy of it myself. And uh, to talk about it with you. And it's not. It, it's the first edition of Vampire that doesn't feel like it's from 1990. Uh, or no. 1999 or whatever. Like, um, Yeah, no, it, it's, it's, it's a modern edition of the game. And it's a modern setting and a modern reimagining. For example, uh, and they've done things quite well, I think, to make the game more interesting. So, for example, uh, how do you deal with the rise of communication technology and how that would affect your game? You know, people spying vampires and things like that. Well, they make it that the vampire society is like, no mobile phones, guys, because if somebody takes a picture of you uh, doing vampire stuff, we're going to get hunted down by the Inquisition, right? So there's a whole... There's a whole storyline that tackles those things, which uh, late 90s obviously doesn't tackle, right? Because things have moved on. Technology mm -hmm. has changed. 
society has changed. And um, yeah, the, the, this is a contemporary game set in the in, in, in the 2020s. Yeah, and I think I think it's it's interesting. I think it's I think it's interesting that even that it even feels more it really does feel more European than prior editions too, even though it tries to guess set itself in Chicago, but it doesn't feel that way. Um I would say that the other thing that's changed is uh the tendency of the rate of IP to fall. Um but uh, which is a which is a joke that I find funny, but um, uh, it, the, the the fact that this IP has not stayed ever fresh because it was so tied up in one project for so long um, that it ate its 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 public visibility, right. um, uh, and so it's hard to imagine how you'd introduce this game to a new generation of gamers. Um, even though the, the, the current edition is actually not bad. I mean, I would say, I mean, if I was going to critique the current edition is actually mostly in design of the physical book that it's so pretty, it's, it's hard to use. It's too glossy. Yeah. I would have liked a few plainer pages. I, I'm not into all the color splash. In, in the yeah, book. it's. It, I would say that it's actually uh, aesthetically over-designed. Yeah, um, totally agree you, with that. And and it's a, it makes it hard to reference actually, but and, and annoying to read. Yeah. Um, but you know it is, it is interesting. But also like now the only genre that they have in the world of darkness is vampire, because everything else is owned by Onyx Path, and Onyx Path is still producing things. It's it's not. I mean. Uh, you know, it drives mithril sellers on drive through RPG. You know, so meaning it's not doing bad in the indie game no. uh, market. And it's surviving. It's surviving. There's a market. They can sell like, you know, a good ton of books, right? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, compared to a lot of things, although I would say that it's st it is now moved from being the default gaming experience and like it was in the late nineties to a kind of niche game. Nostalgia um, game yeah. It's, 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 it's kind of nostalgia. They're still making uh Chronicles of darkness stuff. I think the last vampire, the Requiem book was released in 2020. Yeah. Um, they, that, that's still live too. So they are the premium vampire game players. So you could play in multiple, but, uh, but, and perhaps we'll have to get into a deep dive about the differences in the law and which one is better at some point. Yeah, because I actually, I, I'm weirdly a defender of Vampire the Requiem, but I hate it. I also hated it when it first came out. Like, it well, was. Well, uh, Discord from the Discord Miniatures channel uh. is happy to come on at some point to talk about the merits of Vampire the Requiem and why she thinks, why she has a, why she thinks it's better than Old World of Darkness. I actually, I actually do too. I think it is actually a better. I think it's a better world and a better game, but it's never had the popularity. And I, one thing I will say for, to it, it's harder to lark. It's a more complicated social setup, so it's harder to lark. Uh, um, but it's easier to play as a tabletop game. Well, um, so you know, I would love to discuss that with Discourse. That would be that'd be great because I I, I I want to defend the honor. I think maybe I'm not the only one who's come around to this opinion after 20 years. But well, it's like people, people people get emotional about things. Like when Games Workshop got rid of Warhammer Fantasy, people had a freaking breakdown. But it had become a very cumbersome game, and people like playing Age of Sigma. Now I get it that people were upset that they got rid of it. And also, they made a stupid business decision because then everybody was playing Warhammer Total War, which which is like massive. But I get why they got rid of it because it was a cumbersome rule system, <coughs> and uh, needed to change it. Right. I mean, and to be fair, uh, uh, it doesn't affect the Warhammer RPGs because War Warhammer Fantasy has almost nothing to do. Uh, the tabletop has almost nothing to do with Warhammer. Uh, RPG. It's a, it's a quality 
Well, they've re-released another edition, the fourth edition of it now. Yeah, it's it's a. Uh... I have that over here. It's fourth edition uh, Warhammer Fantasy, which is pretty good. But they, that same company also makes a Age of Sigmar Fantasy, yeah, which is I do which like is nothing uh, like Warhammer you know, Fantasy at all. No, the Warhammer Fantasy roleplay game is very much an iteration on the first and second edition. Third edition is a bit different. Lots of people hate third edition. I actually think it's really good, but it's just a different type of roleplay experience. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I like uh, I like fourth edition. Uh, I love uh, I've played fourth edition. Um, it's a very enjoyable game, uh, but it's not Age of Sigmar. Yeah. So um, that being said, I do have to apologize to everybody watching or listening tonight about my coughing and sneezing. I have been ill. You've been ill for like I, a month. I recovered. But then I sent my son to nursery. He came back with snot, and then I got sick again. So I'm not super sick now, but I've been coughing. Children are the plague carriers. That's what they are. You put them in a room together, they they start producing candlesticks from their noses. So I apologize for my coughing, and I will endeavor not to do that again. Yeah. But we do have exciting programming Coming up, we're going to be talking to Arbiter Ian, who's going to talk about uh, his video about, you know, Warhammer having a far-right fascism problem and um, what we can do about that. And also the responses he got to his video complaining about this far-right problem. Uh, some of which I read, which were quite interesting things, such as everybody's been propagandized to think that Hitler was the bad guy. So, whoa. Um, okay, there, buddy. So we have some we we have some interesting programming coming up. So uh, we will bid you all adieu. Thank you for watching, and as we say on this is revolution. Uh, don't forget to like, subscribe. Uh, become a patron if you can afford. Uh, click the like button. Click the other bell button if you really like what we produce. Make sure you uh, uh, look at <coughs> both This Is Revolution and, of course, Van Vlog, where there's a lot of exciting material coming soon. And, as we say here, we are out. <laughs>